and be glad in it. Good morning. morning. Hello, visitors and church family. We are always so happy that you're here. You know, callings are not just for pastors. You have a calling from God. Every Christian has a ministry. You are trusted and you are so loved. You know, that thing I say every morning, this is the day, that actually comes from Psalms and it actually begins with, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is marvelous in our eyes. For this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So today we're talking about how the stone was rejected and how very often when we experience rejection in life, it's a gift. So hopefully that encourages you today. We want you to leave here full of joy in life, ready for the coming week. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for gathering us in this place. And I thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice whether on television or here in the building, we thank you, God, that you love us and that you've not rejected us, but saved us and called us your own. Thank you, God, that we're the apple of your eye. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. In preparation for the message, Psalm 118, 22. The stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever.
Christopher Palaha is an actor, co-author, and father of three, who has starred in a number of Hallmark films, as well as Wonder Woman 1984 and the upcoming Jurassic World Dominion. Working in Hollywood has given him a mission field to not only share his faith, but be involved in faith-based productions, including the film Where Hope Grows, which is now streaming on Pure Fix. The film is about an unexpected friendship that helped one man put his life back on track. Please welcome Christopher Palaha. Christopher, hi, welcome. We're so glad you're with us. Bobby, thank you so much. What a blessing for me to be there with you guys today. It's our joy. Um, for those who may not know your story, maybe tell us a little bit uh, about your faith journey. Sure. Um, I grew up in a Christian household, so I knew the Lord from a very, very early age. Um, when I was a little boy, I spent a ton of time in prayer and used to just talk to the Holy Spirit. And then very quickly, I'll just I'll, I'll let your friends know that uh, when I was 17, I had this sort of prayer of pride. And uh, your topic is rejection today. And I, in a, in a sense, rejected my relationship with God. Um, out of pride. I just wanted to know if the good things that were happening in my life were his doing or were, they were mine. And I sort of wandered for six years uh, spiritually, always considered myself a Christian in that time, but didn't really act like it wasn't really in relationship. Um, and then God just, he, he reached out and he wanted me back and he grabbed a hold of my heart. And um, I have been deep in relationship with Jesus ever since. That was in college uh, right there at the tail end, um, my wife, who's an amazing Christian, and her father was an amazing pastor of the Lord, uh, Southern Baptist from Alabama, um, just really sort of have been walking alongside of me for the past 20 years. And, and yeah, using Hollywood as a mission field and, and taking every opportunity I can to, to really shine Christ's light. It's an interesting question. You hear this story a lot. I, I don't know enough about the Amish to comment on it, but my understanding is that very often like Amish kids will be encouraged to actually do what you did to sort of spread their wings for a little bit. I'm, I don't know the details, but. It's called a rump springer, I oh, think. Oh, so you know, okay. Was, yeah, it's a rump springer, yeah, they go off and they, and they see if they want to really do this for, or not. Yeah, did you feel like your brief time, that's, well, not super brief, six years of sort of, do you feel like that was a good thing for you? Um, or what, what do you think? You know, it's funny, um, Bobby, my wife, uh, like I said, her name is Julianne and her life has always been tied so tightly to Jesus and she never wavered. And she always says she's never smoked cigarettes. She's never, she doesn't really drink anything. She's, she's a great girl waited, uh, you know, for marriage, the whole thing, purity. And we have three boys and her story is far more interesting and far more compelling than all the stuff that I can't talk about where I'm like, yeah, I mean, you don't want to, you know? So it's like, it's like, what was interesting is I did this thing called semester at sea in college and I ran around the world and I wanted to study world theater because I'm an actor and I wanted to study world religion. And I went to all these temples and I went to all these different places, houses of worship around the world and really wanted to do a deep dive in, in what other people were believing in. And it's funny because my roommate was this guy named Ryan Johnson from Atlanta, and he was a born again Christian. And he was like, brother, have you really ever dived into the Bible? Have you ever really read God's word? And it was the first time that, of course, I grew up in a household. I grew up with, in a Christian home and I'd gone to church literally every Sunday of my life. And like I said, I was praying and I was in relationship for a long, long time. But doing that deep dive and looking at the comparison of our God through Christ and all of these other houses of worship, like I started to realize, so for me, that was good because I can stand in confidence and I can talk about my faith in a very intelligent way. And I can compare it to other world religions. And I can say, well, I understand that this is what happens in the Quran. I can understand in, in Hinduism or Buddhism or Shintoism, what goes on, but what Jesus is talking about is totally radically different. And there gives me, it gives me a little bit of authority. So in that sense, it was good. Um, but I feel like I lost six years of wisdom and growth and maturity in Christ when I kind of stepped away. So if you're young, don't I don't do recommend <laughs> the rump springer. I, I stick with it. Even though you might have your own questions, you can still figure it out while walking in relationship with God. Now, I heard you had a, you're going to be in the coming movie Jurassic World Dominion. Uh, and I heard you had a near death experience. Uh, is that true? I did. They're, un, they're, they're only related in the sense that my roommate from college is the guy who's directing Jurassic World Dominion. And so he and I went to NYU together way, way back, graduated in 99. 
And um, he he called me up, but he was a part of my life at this moment. Right right before I went on semester at sea, which is where I met Colin, um, I was walking in New York City. And this was at the end of my, like I said, my wilderness period. And uh, I was with a friend of mine, Catherine Smith, and we walking around New York City. And there was a 10,000 things that we could have done that would have put us in a different situation or at a different place in a different time that night. But where we were happened to be in front of this store and in the basement, this man was trying to burn his restaurant down for insurance purposes. And Catherine was, uh, I was between her and the traffic and I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit and I moved and I switched sides with her and I said, I don't know why, but I feel better on this side of you. And about a block later, the building exploded and we were caught in this blast. Um, it was 120 stitches for me. And because I moved, I was wearing this thick sheep shear leather jacket and cords and boots. And I basically eclipsed all the glass that probably more than likely would have killed Catherine. Um, and even when we were in the emergency room, the, the ER doctor said, you know, you should, or the, actually the fire marshal came in to interview us and said, you know, you should have been decapitated because they were the first, they were frisbee sized pieces of glass that were a quarter inch thick and, you know, storefront window glass. Um, and that was actually the moment where I felt God's hand in my life. Um, there were so many supernatural moments in that near death experience. And then the week after Bobby, I don't know if you've ever gone to sleep and right before you dis like drift off to sleep, God just gives you an epiphany and you see a truth or you understand something sort of greater than your scope of knowledge would allow you to comprehend. I was living in that sort of epiphany feeling for about a week. And I would see people and I would, if they had joy, I would just start laughing. And if they were carrying a lot of sorrow, I would start crying. And I knew that God had spared me for a re like suddenly I was not supposed to be alive. And I was, and th that night I went to sleep when I, it was a whole night thing, surgery, all the stitches and everything that took place. So that next night when I went to sleep, I remember my prayer. I just said, Lord, I want to go to you, God. Like, I want to go to you. I want to go to you. Like, I want you back. And it was just a rushing in because I feel like we all have this God-sized hole in our lives. And I feel like that's what I was trying to fill. And I was using acting as sort of a false idol and I was using pride and I was, you know, and then I realized that those things were never going to fill. And so I just wanted God to rush in and fill that up. And it's amazing the work that he does in my life. You said you're talking about rejection today. Um, it took me 120 auditions or 110 auditions my first year out after NYU of no, of being told no before I got cast in my first job. It was a lot of rejection. In my life to this day, I still, I get rejected, you know, probably 10 times for every one time someone says yes to me. And without faith, I don't know how people do it. <laughs> I really don't. Well, and that's a good point, is, is a lot of people can't do it uh, because when you have your identity rooted in your job or, or you know, your dream, even though we want people to have successful careers and big dreams, if your identity is located there, it can be a trap. Well, that's an amazing story. I also want to encourage people to check out your movie. It came out a few years ago, but it's going to be on Pure Flix now called Where Hope Grows. It's a great film. What kind of um, encouragement do you want people to get from that film? I just, I want people to know that, that really it's about kingdom living and really it's about this idea that there's a character in it named Produce who has Down syndrome. And he lives his life with so much love and joy and kindness. And he just, he's so present. And my character, Calvin, he's a failed baseball. Uh, he played, you know, major league baseball. He's failed. He's drinking himself to death. So there are some heavy themes in it, but it's still, I think it's, a, I, mean, I would say it's a family film for people who have younger children. Um, and it really is, a, it's a, it's a, it's a movie about hope and ultimately where that grows is in Jesus Christ. And so you see this guy forming a relationship, Calvin and produce, but also Calvin and God. And I think it's a, a pretty well-told story in regards to, um, I think a lot of Christian films are, are speaking to Christians. And I feel like this, the goal of this film was to speak to people who may not know Jesus yet and who may not understand what that looks like. And here was a, it's almost a coming in from the ground level, you know, point of view of what that looks like. Well, it's a great film. I want to encourage people to check it out where hope grows on Pure Flix. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your testimony and your life. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here, Bobby. Hello, church family. Today we are here to praise and worship the Lord. And so we want you to join us, all right, as we magnify his name. 
This song is called Eyes on You. Choir, help us. Just won't quit But if I look to the hills From which cometh my help If I do, I know I'll win I'll keep my eyes on you I'll keep my eyes on you Yeah, you told me everything you do So I keep my eyes on Eyes on you Thank you for joining us in worship today. As we emerge from a long season of being separated from each other, we now realize that the simple act of gathering with loved ones is something we cannot take for granted. It truly nourishes our souls and is such a pure and godly gift. Jesus loved to gather with people at big celebrations like weddings or smaller gatherings like lunch or dinner. It was at these gatherings that he would minister to folks from every background, from the elite to the sinners, and he would heal and redeem them. At Hour of Power, we care about your journey with Christ and your entry back into the abundance the Lord has to offer when we gather with loved ones. 
Psalm 36, seven and eight says, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. Our Savior welcomes each of us to taste His blessings and to drink of His delights. And this is what our power is all about. By helping us take the gospel message around the globe, you enable millions to feast on the wonders of the Lord's goodness from the comfort of their own homes. To help you plan your next gathering and to make your entertaining a little easier, we've created a unique offer just for you. Call, write, or go online today and request the Gather Here Complete Charcuterie Set. Included in this set is a bamboo cutting and display board, a four-piece cheese knife set, and our 40-page charcuterie recipes and tips book called Gather Here, Charcuterie for Family and Friends. We're asking for your gift of just $75 or more for all three items. Friends, your faithfulness to our ministry and your generosity is what makes Hour of Power possible and available to yearning hearts around the world. Thank you so much. And remember, as always, God loves you, and so do we. Would you stand with us? We're going to say this creed together as we do every week. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with my neighbor. Thanks, you can be seated. I've always loved that creed. It was in my personal life before we brought it here to the church and it helped me so much because it brought me freedom Freedom from feeling like my whole identity is wrapped up in what I do, especially like not just morally, but what I do for a, like a living, like my job, or my identity is wrapped up on, in what people say about me and or the things I have, the car I have. And today we're going to talk a little bit about that, especially about what people say about you and what it's like in life when you experience a kind of rejection. A rejection is something that all of us experience in different ways. It has an impact on us physically. The chemicals in our body actually change when we experience insult or rejection. And it's, it's very hard uh, to experience whenever it does. Maybe you just experienced one, or maybe it's been a while, but there's another one coming. There will be, I promise. Whether it's a job you applied for and you didn't get it, or maybe you applied to you know, your favorite college or some kind of academic program and you were rejected. Or, uh, or just being uninvited, you know, being a part of a group of friends and you notice that your friends grow out and you didn't get invited and you sort of had the sneaking feeling that maybe you don't belong as much as you thought you did or you thought you were building this friendship and you wonder what's going on. So in life, when this happens so often, I know for me, it's easy to start spinning my wheels. Why would they say something like that? Why would they do something like that to me? I've had multiple nights of sleep ruined because of something a stranger randomly said to me. Today we're going to get freedom from that, okay? Let's get freedom from that and learn that when somebody insults us, hurts us, or rejects us, in most cases, it's a gift, actually. It's a gift. You are so loved by God. And you probably have a lot of people in your life who love you. I know this church loves you. I love you. God loves you. And there are many people in this world that are going to be for you, that are going to root for you. But because of that, just to belong to Jesus, if you truly love what is good and hate what is evil, you're going to experience rejection. But can I tell you, that rejection is a gift. It's a gift. Today we're going to believe that the rejection didn't happen to you, it happened for you. The rejection didn't happen to you, it happened for you. It's a brutal feeling, especially when you have a gift to give. Musicians, I'm sure you guys have had plenty of things you tried out for and you got rejected and you're like, I know I was the best one. I just didn't know the right people, All right? Or whatever it is. Can I tell you, friends, today we're gonna learn that every rejection is such 
It can be such a gift if you can see it the right way, if you can see it through the lens of the kingdom of God. I've been rejected lots of times, and, uh, and not just by girls, by lots of things. You know, there's been a, <laughs> just kidding. And I got the best one. So there was this study that was done, um, and I really struggled on how to talk about this study. It involves the curse word A-H. All right, that's as far as we're going to go. We're going to refer to the, the, the cuss as A-H. If you're still struggling, H stands for whole. All right, so if you don't have it yet, maybe you're international, you don't, English isn't your first language, ask your neighbor, what does A-H stand for? And uh, if somebody asks you, don't say it out loud. I first ran into the study in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, but it, I had a chance to read the study myself from the University of Michigan. Uh, done by two professors, uh, Doveco and Nisbet. And they wanted to study cultures of honor and particularly about how people got offended. You can read the study yourself online. But it went like this. As so many great studies go, they have a, like a fake study that has nothing to do with what they're studying and then they have a fake, and then a real dramatic thing in the middle to see how people respond. It went like this. First they asked the question, what's the insult that universally gets every male between the age of like 18 to 22. Like what's the thing we can say to them that strikes to the heart of them? And the word was A-H, all right, A-H. And if you say this to a college male, it gets them, you know? And so they, they did this thing where they had all the males in this study fill out a questionnaire and then the questionnaire didn't mean anything. It was, just a, it was just like a fake thing. You take the questionnaire down this very narrow hallway in the library that only really one person could fit through and it was lined with filing cabinets. And you're supposed to go to the very end and put your questionnaire in there. But they had another 20 year old kid or whatever who was also there who was pretending to be a part of the study but wasn't. And he would purposefully, as part of the study, open one of the things to block the way, put the thing in, and as the kid tried to get around him, would nudge him a little bit like this, and then whisper under his voice, A-H, like this. <laughs> Enough so that the guy could hear it. And then they, when the kids came back, they measured a few things. First they measured, is their handshake grip tighter? And they, they um, took a saliva sample to see if their testosterone and cortisol went up, which, is, which shows like fight or flight and a lot of like anger. And then they also did this story about Steve and his girlfriend Jill and how Jill is being bothered and hit on by a mutual friend named Larry and what should Steve do about it. And what they found was throughout, now they had students from all over the country in the United States and most of them had no change at all. But from one region of the world, almost universally, they all went way up. The cortisol, testosterone went up, the handshake was more firm, and they said that there would be a violent outcome between Steve and Larry. And now if you are a local American, you might know what that region is. It was the South, all right, the South. All the men from the South had this kind of reaction. And let me just pause here for a moment to say how much I adore the South. We lived in Oklahoma, which isn't really the South, it's the prairie, I guess, but the census considers it the South, but folks from Mississippi and Alabama probably don't consider it the South. Or maybe it's the South, but it's not the deep South, but it's a similar culture. But anyway, they found that the men from the South who were living in Michigan had this kind of response. And then the funniest part of the story, the second part, they would have those same young men walk down that, that hallway, and then right as they're going down the hallway, they would have another guy who was also a student and a member of the football team. He was six foot three, 230 pounds, about my size, big, big guy, bruiser. And we'd come around, and the guy that was walking towards him, they played like a game of chicken. And they wanted to see how long it would be before this bruiser guy, who by the way was a bouncer at the local bar as well as being on the football team, how, how soon the person would give way. Now, in all of the cases of the students from the north and from Michigan and the west coast, they, it was in both cases about five or six feet they would let the guy pass, you know. But here's what was funny with the, the guys from the south, if they were in the control group, meaning they hadn't just been insulted, they would actually give way about nine or ten feet away, double 
right? Because manners is polite, we'll let you go by. But of the group that had been insulted, it was two feet. <laughs> two feet! You know how close two feet is? It smell the guy's breath, it's like this far. They're like chicken, he's like, I'm not gonna move. I'm not gonna move. The guy before called me an A-H. <laughs> okay. So in unpacking the study, the resolve was, this is because in the South, Southerners are a, are a people of honor. So it's a type of culture that you see throughout the world that the South is made up in large part of uh, Scotch-Irish immigrants who were herders and shepherds who had these sort of unwritten rules from an immigrant community hundreds of years ago that brought those and created sort of the culture of the South. And this is Malcolm Gladwell's conclusion as well. As someone who's very familiar with the South, I think that's partly true, but that's not the whole package. Yes, it's a, it's a culture of honor. And I would say that one, people in the South, aside from having amazing food, do you guys know what fried okra is? I have a friend who's from California who didn't know what a critter was. And I'm like, if you don't know what a critter is, how can you make a comment about the South at all? A very special place, the South. I actually love it. I love going there and I love the people. But, but I actually think it's not as much the culture of honor and it is. I think it's more about a culture of humility and manners that is really important, that it's important to be humble. Maybe that's a part of a culture of honor. But even more than that, it's this. It's that the South is religious. Look at a map here. This is a honeycomb map of the United States. Um, and you can see here, the darker the blue region, the more religious it is. You get up there into Yankee territory, it's like God left a long time ago, all right? <laughs> They're not into it at all, right? And you get down to like Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee, and it is like religious. That's the most religious part. And can I tell you, we all know what religion it is, right? They are Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians. And their, their grandpa and grandma was a Christian, and their great-great-grandpa was a Christian. And, and it's, a, it's a type of Christianity. It's, it's our type of Christianity, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians. There is something about our, our faith and our love for God, our love for what is good, and our, our hatred for what is evil, our clear distinctions between right and wrong, right, that, that, are, that are so ingrained within us that so often, whether we're in the South or whether we're here in Orange County, that if you're a Christian, this is very often the part that's, that's lost, is the idea that being rejected, being insulted, being put down, being cussed out is part of the package of being a believer. And that we get freedom as Christians when we allow that stuff to not get under our skin. I think the reason these young men were so offended by the word A-H is because it's clearly wrong, right, to call somebody a word like that. And there is actually something built in them to stand up for what is good and to, to stand up for what is right. That's actually what I think it is. I think it was, in a way, came from a good place. But, it, but the outcome was a bad thing. You find, and I found this a lot, this is even something I had to work through as a young man, the urge to fight and to always tell it like it is and to always push and, and make it clear. Like That stuff, it, there's sometimes when that has to happen for sure, but in life in general, we have to understand that there are just going to be AHs out there that are going to treat us poorly. You know what I mean? I got to let go of the AH thing. This, this is not going to. But, you know, but, I, but that there are people out there. There's always going to be, there's always going to be rude people. There's always going to be whatever. People who say things about you that aren't true, that aren't fair, that aren't good. But as Christians, here's one way we can see it. We can take Jesus' words to heart. He says, blessed are you. You know, that word blessed, makarios, also means happy. Happy are you or blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad 
For great is your reward in the kingdom of heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you want to be like the prophets and if you want to be like Jesus, you have to be okay with the fact that you'll be rejected and insulted and put down. Now, this is not just a a message about how to be holy from Jesus. This is good advice. It is good advice to not allow the random stupid things that strangers say or do to us to affect my joy, to affect my sleep at night, or to affect how I talk to my family when I get home, whether or not I'm all, right, upset. But we do it, and I do it too, and it's it's something you can grow, you can work out of your life. Don't be like Marty McFly. Remember in um, Back to the Future, I rewatched the trilogy recently, and this only becomes a problem in Back to the Future 2, which was a surprise. But uh, Marty McFly, you can get him to do anything you want if you just call him, do you remember the word? Chicken. You call Marty McFly a chicken, you can get him to do just about anything you want him to do. So many of us, we have key words, phrases or ideas, we have people in our life that just somehow know how to turn the screws on us. Be free from that. Don't allow what people say to you or what they might think about you or what they might post about you. Don't allow that to control your life. Today, it's time to get freedom. Root your identity and your life in God's love and kindness for you and build your life around that. And have people in your life that aren't gonna manipulate you. You'll get more freedom in life. You'll be smarter. And although you've been rejected by the world or you've been rejected by your job or you've been rejected by whoever, someone you're attracted to or betrayed or insulted or uninvited, there is someone, the Lord, who loves you. And there's a church, Shepherd's Grove, and there are people that are out there who will love you right where you're at and be your friend right right where you're at. And that's the best place to be. Can I get an amen amen from those who have been rejected? The rejection was a gift, my friend. The rejection was a gift. It was a gift. And it can be one of the best things that happens to you in life. This is what Peter was saying to the church in Asia Minor. Asia Minor is today Turkey, but back then it was really Ionian Greece. It was a a Greek people that were in the Roman Empire. And uh, and it was full of of immigrants and different people. And it was definitely a melting pot, a lot of Asia Minor. A lot of the cities there were economic hubs and cultural hubs and... And the church just thrived there and was doing well. And so when Peter writes a letter to the church, he's targeting a lot of these churches in Asia Minor. And he says to them, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also are living stones. This is a very heavy idea and a good idea. You're living stones and you're being built into a spiritual house By the way, that house in Hebrew also is the word temple. You're being built into a temple. The Jews always called the temple the house. To be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But but to those who do not believe, the stone the builder has rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Uh, Peter is saying, you look in a world around you and you feel rejected by your neighbors, but never forget, they rejected the, the chief stone. They rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected the best person who has ever lived. They rejected the most intelligent, joy-filled person who has ever existed. They rejected him. And if you're anything like him, they'll reject you too. Isn't that encouraging? I think there's another part of this as well, that in Asia Minor, it's easy for 
God's people to look around and kind of say, we don't have a temple. So like, uh, here's the temple of Aphrodite. And this is also pulled from a video game, I'm sorry. But, the, <laughs> but it's perfectly done. This is exactly how it was, actually. Uh, this is a, imagine like you're a new believer and this is where your family goes. Look how beautiful it is. And this is where they have all the celebrations and the food and everything. And they're like, won't you come? Won't you? And you're like, and you're kind of like, hey, Peter, can we get a, can we get like a cool temple? Like, can we have like a cool building? Like, and, uh, and Peter says, you, you're living stones. You're living stones. This building, the reason I have to pull it from a video game is it's just rubble today. It's not even there anymore. You go by and it, it's just like a couple of pillars knocked over. And that's how every building will be, except for one, the temple of God, which is made of people like you. If you love the Lord, and the sad thing is, if you really love your neighbor and you live out the, with the kind of kindness and goodness that God has called you to, some people will reject you as well. Is that okay? Yeah. You are a living stone. But today, my friend, I want you to get freedom from the idea that someone you barely know who rejects you can control your life. There's a lot of talk, and there should be, about how speech harms people. And I think that some of that talk is important. I think it's good to do some training about protecting people from, from harmful and hateful speech. And yet I think what's better is if we can teach people uh, a greater strength. And that is rather than always trying to make, especially adults, safer, we should make people stronger. And this is what the gospel is intended to do, is to show us that our identity in our life is not rooted in what angry people or hateful people say about you. You just let it go. And I want you to be the kind of person that can hear the most offensive, hurtful thing in the world and let it roll off your back like water off a duck's back. You can be that way when you know that there are people out there who love you as you are and you can sort of uh, move on. So there is freedom when we find our value in what God says about us. And we train our bodies, especially through prayer or through other things that the church offers, to not be obsessive about what people think about us. But things like social media and other things like that are training especially young people to do the opposite, to be obsessive about what random strangers we've never thought of, what they say about us. And let's let it go. Let's get some freedom today. It's like being cussed out in French. You ever been cussed out in French? It's, it's not a big deal. <laughs> Unless you speak French. It sounds cool. Um, but imagine for, for a moment that after the church service, I'm standing here and I'm talking to people and a random gentleman who only speaks French didn't like what I said. And he came up and he started cursing me out in French. Now I don't speak, I speak a little French. Um, I had a teacher uh, in high school and she told us all to have names, and the name that I picked was Poisson. And she said, you can't do Poisson, you can do Robert. Poisson means fish. And I said, I know. It's the only French word I know because of Little Mermaid. That's right. <laughs> le Poisson, le Poisson. Le. Is it? It's the only French word he says in the whole thing. So I was like, I'll just be Poisson. And she's like, that means fish. I was like, I thought it meant chef, but OK, fish it is. And. Uh, so the only phrase I really learned was, est-ce que je peux aller au double WC, s'il vous plaît? That's, may I leave and go use the restroom, please? The WC. <laughs> what am I talking about? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, the French guy. So imagine I'm down here, and a guy starts cussing me out in French. We, all of us who don't speak French would simply kind of look at him and sort of scratch our heads. And we might even start laughing. You know, because it's in a language we don't understand. And he may get super aggressive and raise his voice even more, and we just might go like this. What if we could be, get the kind of freedom in the same way if somebody cusses us out in English? 
what if we could get the same kind of freedom when somebody says something about us or betrays us or whatever, where we just, it just, we just realize it doesn't, it doesn't really say much about us. It says everything about this person. And almost look upon the person with pity and pray for them and hope that maybe God can bring them freedom from whatever's driving this, this anger and sadness and fear, whatever it is. I want you to know that you may have recently experienced rejection, but it'll happen again and you can get freedom uh, from the opinions of others. The rejection was a gift. It was a gift. Sometimes when you're rejected, God is protecting you. There might have been a job that was, you thought was your dream job, but you never realized that it would have been the worst job on earth. You would have been unhappy. Your marriage would have fallen apart. You would have started being meaner to your kids and you would have lost a ton of money on the drive because of the commute, because we live in Southern California or whatever. There might have been a person in your life that you thought you were supposed to be with. And on this, you know, the person you know, you thought they would have been amazing. But after, if you would have married that person or whatever, they would have been horrible to you. Or it might be that, um, you know, there was a group of friends, but, you know, you were rejected from them. But if you'd gotten more involved with that friends, you would have noticed that you'd become more of a shallow person or more vain or less happy or compared yourselves to them. God is constantly allowing us to experience these things in many ways because he's protecting us from something we don't know. Sometimes when we're rejected, God is forcing us to choose. There are all sorts of things in life that happen where maybe you even have two things in, in life, but you can't have both. And God's asking you to choose between, between the two. That might be happening in your life now. Sometimes God is showing you where you can grow. And this is, if you have the strength for it, this is where something like getting rejected from a job or other things, even if it's done poorly, even if it was offensive, you might be able to find something in there that your friends wouldn't tell you about yourself just because they love you too much. You know what I mean by that? Like maybe, maybe that interview didn't go very well and you can, you can think about how to interview better or maybe there was something about it that just people, you're just so nice, people love you, they're not gonna tell you, but because you got rejected, instead of saying that wasn't fair, you can even figure out like how can I improve, like in a work environment, for example. And finally, and this happens all the time, sometimes God is just preparing you for a bigger thing. Maybe he's preparing you for leadership. Hear me, this is the last thing I'm gonna say. If you want to be a leader, a big influencer in, in the world, you must prepare yourself for lots of unfair criticism. You must prepare yourself. I, when I started and I prepared for this role, I prepared myself for criticism of what I did, but I didn't prepare myself for criticism of what I didn't do. You know what I mean? And you think about the early church. They were called cannibals because they ate the body and blood of Jesus. They were called incestuous because they would call each other brother and sister, and yet many of them were married. In life, if you're leading, especially if you're leading for God, you just have to kind of be okay with the fact that you'll become a target of slander. And that's a really sad thing, but it will just happen. And so sometimes the little insults that you experience in life might be God preparing you to stop finding your identity in what other strangers say and find your identity in him. If you get cut off on the freeway or if somebody gives you the bird on the five today and you can't sleep tonight, you're not ready for leadership. <laughs> it's just that simple. You, if, that, if what some random person you've never met and are never going to see again and it has no impact on your life at all, except you might get to where you're going three seconds later than you would have, you have to be ready for people you know or kind of know or respect to say things or assume things about the different. You just have to grow as a person and be okay with the fact that people are gonna criticize you. I would challenge you to think of one world changer, whether they're on your team or not on your team, who doesn't come under constant criticism from someone else. If you're not ready for that, you're not ready to lead. And it might be that the reason you've experienced some more offense lately is God is actually training you 
to learn what it means to just shrug your shoulders and just say, eh, it's okay, I'm a child of God. Or he might be teaching you that, hey, this is where I grow. But no matter what, I want you to stop looking at rejection as something to be angry about, something to be offended by, something that's unfair, and instead look at it as a gift. The rejection was a gift. It didn't happen to you. It happened for you. We can thank God for that. So Lord, we do. We ask you to build in us the Holy Spirit that confirms in us that you're still doing a good thing in us. We accept, sadly, with broken hearts, that many people will not accept us as we are. And we just let that go to you, Lord. We ask you to help us grow, to be deeper in love and kindness. Help us to, re to see these rejections as gifts and help us, Lord, to be more like you, Jesus. We love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. subscribe to our channel yet? If not, then I hope you will. Our power is filled with uplifting content to nourish your spirit and help you grow closer to Jesus. We've created this channel to remind you that no matter who you are or what you've done, God loves you and so do we.